Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, so I'm Martin Borthwick, uh, a senior hydrologist. Uh, I'm working in the Flood Hydrology Improvements Programme, which is a, an R&D programme uh, for the Environment Agency. I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Um, I've titled my talk, Engaging with Emerging Digitally Enabled Environmental Science, a bit of a mouthful, um, but that is essentially what we're attempting to do in this programme, and it's representative of some of our approaches to how we work with what's coming forward through uh, research and development and how we attempt to build that into what we do going forward. But a few caveats on the way and hopefully that will help you understand a bit about um, how that works uh, for us. So a couple of examples. Okay, so uh, in my part of the organisation, we're a big organisation with 10,000 staff, so I'm just one bit of it. Um, so uh, flood risk management is a big challenge for us as a nation, uh, but for us also as an environment agency. So we have powers for undertaking uh, works uh, to uh, provide protection against flooding against the coast, uh, against inland uh, rivers. And we uh, carry out also a flood forecasting role to provide warning and instant response for that. So it's a big challenge for us to give you an idea of scale in terms of providing sort of <laughs> semi-permanent defences for, organiza uh, for <coughs> organisations, households and so on. Um, back in 2020, the government doubled its expenditure to £5.2 billion pounds over the period 2021 to 2027 to invest in better protecting up to about 333,000 uh, uh, additional properties. So it's a very, very big uh, uh, scale for us um, in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, so a little bit about how we approach that and why that this digitally enabled environmental science fits in. Um, if we look at this uh, chain, as we call it, of uh, uh, flood risk modelling, flood modelling, uh, if we work from left across to right, we've got two types of activities. As I've said, we do forecasting work, which is sort of reactive, getting ready. We've got the weather shows something's going to happen. We want to help uh, warn people, protect people as best we can in that instant. But also that longer term view, that bottom line, the capital programme, investing that money uh, to provide uh, better resilience for communities, flood protection works and so on. Um, but broadly, we're using the same sort of information uh, as we develop from data and modelling through to uh, decision making. So we start with meteorology data, weather data, uh, measurements as well um, of uh, what we call hydrology and meteorology. So things like rainfall, river flow, groundwater levels and so on. Uh, then we do some form of modelling. Uh, the bit that I'm involved in is the bit that I've shaded in blue here. That's the hydrology. That's the uh, hydrological cycle, it rains, where does that water go? Um, that's very, very complex, as you can imagine, in the natural environment. Um, so we do quite a lot of modelling within that part of the, uh, the chain to convert that data into something which we can then make some predictions with, the frequency, the magnitude of flooding, um, the shape of those uh, flood events as they happen through time, the shape of that flood in the river, um, for example. Uh, we then do some inundation modelling. We've got a better handle on that. There's a little bit less uncertainty, perhaps, in some of that uh, in terms of where that water goes as it moves through river channels and floodplains, for example, or through, uh, as surface water. Uh, where does it end up? Who gets flooded? By how much and when? And, of course, we can then assess the impacts. And then we make a decision. If it's for warning, do we issue a warning against the predicted model outputs? Um, do we mobilise some form of uh, instant response to protect the community? Uh, or if it's longer term, what sort of scale of defences must we invest in? How much is that going to cost? What's the effect on the environment? How do we mitigate for that? Uh, what are the best solutions to make? And how do we go back and remodel that? So uh, that's how we fit our environmental science and the data into that flood modelling chain. Um, so a couple of examples about how the sort of emerging science is important to us in that modelling uh, data analysis environment. So this is one that we've been involved in and we've recently uh, uh, produced. This is an enhancement to an existing product and it gives an idea of some of that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary working. So I work for a big organisation. I'm not on the regulatory side, but I've got plenty of colleagues who work in water resources, for example, and in fact they developed this original product and it was to share water quality, uh, uh, water quantity information with customers be it water companies and whoever. So it was a fairly small-scale project to, uh, to start with, and it was a proof of concept, and that was developed a few years ago. But over time, it's gained traction. Lots of people use it. Um, then the Flood Hydrology Improvements Program came along, which I'm involved in, which is a, a six-year, £7 million program to look at how we improve doing the hydrology bit uh, for flood risk assessment. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could share more of that data to help 
our customers, consultants, other end users do the sort of analysis work for us in designing flood protection works for communities. Because previously, they'd have to go and ask us for it. And that takes time. Somebody's got to get the data out of the archive, pass it on to them, and that could take quite a bit of time in terms of days because of the other workload. Um, if we can put it all into a, uh, a system and make it publicly available, then uh, the public has got it. Uh, and that's not just consultants, it's everybody. So we've scaled up uh, significantly. So we've now got 4 billion stored data points. That's from a, around about 7,000 hydrometric measurement stations. That's stations that measure things like rainfall, river flow, groundwater level, river level, uh, also other uh, uh, items relating to, to water quality. And we've now got that in a mapped product. And it's hosted on the uh, DEFRA um, platform, the .gov.uk platform. And it's our whole period of archive. So it's everything we've got in the past that was digitally available, um, plus we update it where we can through telemetry feeds. So it's the best we've got, and that represents all our operational stations. So it's a big expansion of that service. We see that as providing huge value then to not just as consultants, but actually to the research community, to some of you here in this audience and, and your colleagues. Um, if the data is out there, well, then you can do something useful for it. So it's yet another data source, but it comes direct from us. Um, what we've learned on the way, of course, is that as soon as you make that available, as soon as you think about making it available, you then have to ask yourself the question, well, what's the quality of that data? What could people do with it, uh, and what could go wrong? And we've been mulling over that for uh, quite a while, as you can imagine. So we've done our best to provide suitable metadata to associate with it, to say something about the quality of the data, but that's still a challenge. Uh, and I'll come back to that when I conclude at the end uh, about that, how much we, we, we share and how much we want to share of our data uh, it, about, about trying to get that right. Um, demand is great. Um, people are really uh, using this data. Uh, we did a, a pilot exercise when we first released this, and the data was accessed over 100 million times in 18 months. That was via an API, and we had up to 10,000 calls per month via the web interface. Uh, and that was just getting started. That's before we kind of spread the word, really. Um, the data is not completely free, though. You don't have to pay for it, but it's not free of responsibility. So as soon as you, as an end user, take that data and do something with it, you are then responsible for what you do with it and for what it means, interpreting it um, uh, and how that is then perceived by any other people that use that data thereafter. So that's an important thing uh, for us to bear in mind. Okay, uh, it doesn't finish there. Um, we've got loads of other data. Uh, we've got lots of old data and charts and, 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 and paper records of all sorts. Uh, and we're struggling. There's a, I have a colleague who estimated we've got 10,000 years equivalent of these charts. Um, so that's not something we're going to digitize overnight. Uh, it's only going to be done using scanners and old technology. So there's a challenge. So if that's uh, something that um, uh, chimes with you, then we've got a couple of conferences coming up. Uh, one is online, the Data 23 conference. It's one of those events on Tuesday, 26th of September. If you want to be involved, dial into that. If you want to do it in person at the Royal Geographical Society on the 7th of November, we've got a, an in-person workshop for people to engage with us about how do we do this effectively. So, um, yeah, it's going from chart to digital. It's um, not easy. The second project I wanted to uh, put before you was about how we, instead of just sharing our data and working with our colleagues in different parts of the organization to bring data together, uh, is how do we see ourselves as enabling some of the research and development to become operational practice? And that came up this morning. And it's a big thing for researchers. I, I used to be an academic. I, I know that challenge. Um, so this is one project in this flood hydrology improvements program looking at alternative methods for flood hydrology. That's how we estimate the magnitude and frequency of flooding and the shape of those uh, flood events over time. So what we decided we're going to do is to attempt to benchmark what we currently do, set that baseline, and then measure alternative me me uh, methods against that to see um, what they offer. That's not just for their scientific um, uh, improvement, but actually, are they useful? And that's something that is very precious to us, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So we want to develop this benchmarking framework uh, so we can choose the, the best practical uh, flood estimation and modeling methods for operational practice. Right? We're working in collaboration with our uh, partner organizations, uh, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, Natural Resources Wales, and the Department for Infrastructure in Northern Ireland, just to get that broader UK uh, view on this. And we're just getting started. We haven't decided anything yet. We're just collecting our ideas together. 
We hope to produce a system for benchmarking, um, and that will comprise a set of tests, data, and metrics, so we can quantify the performance, but also look at um, usability, um, effectiveness in operational practice. And as I say, we'll review what we currently do. And this is in response to that volume of emerging science and uh, modeling methods that are around. Can we pick from those things that offer a genuine improvement to how th we, we do things now? So what could it offer? So somebody develops a new method, we put it through our benchmarking service, they can publish their results and say it's been benchmarked, this is how it performs against other methods, gives it some additional credibility. Um, we might decide, can we go a step further? Can we make it operationally available by an appropriate risk management authority, environment agency, or one of the other organizations? And for that, we need to apply those usefulness tests, and we're still working on what they might be. Um, my colleague, Sally Brown, this morning mentioned some of those things that are precious to us, and they are very important. How much does a, a, a change in the way in which we do things cost? How much training is needed? What data requirements are there? How long does it actually take to move a very large number of people at work within a particular sector over to a new way of working? And I don't mean people working for the Environment Agency. I mean all those consultants and others who do work for us in the flood risk estimation space. So it's not a thing you can just do overnight. But we recognize we need to emerge, uh, develop and, uh, with these emerging technologies and solutions and bring them in where they are offering operational advantages to us. And that will add additional value and impact. So a few closing thoughts. Um, we're evidence-based. We use data. We collect a lot of data. We use a lot of derived data from models. Um, it's really important. It underpins all our decision-making. Um, uncertainty is also evidence and we live with uncertainty. We've not talked a lot about uncertainty today, but of course we know all about that. It's very important to us as an agency and because we deal with uh, that, that weather data, that hydrometric data, and it is uncertain, and we have to make decisions using that uncertain data. And that's something that we have to be careful of when we make decisions about what methods we might, might adopt in the future. Digital open data is making a difference. Lots of people are already using it. It's not completely free of that responsibility, um, but it's gonna um, help change things into the future, we're, we're sure of that, and we're gradually making more data open. There's a lot of demand uh, from end users saying, well, you've got this, can we have more? Um, it's only as good as its metadata. It needs the story, the narrative around it, where do you get the data from? How is it measured? Is it any good? How does it, how does it compare with anything else you've got? And finally, benchmarking is one way of looking at bringing new science into the fold, as it were, operationally where it does genuinely offer um, an, an improvement to operational practice, but it's got to fit those criteria, those usefulness criteria. And sometimes you can be disappointed because you think you've got the best thing since sliced bread, and, and maybe you have in a way, but there may be various operational reasons why it can't be adopted right away. It may take time. But we're trying to develop an objective way of doing that, and I think benchmarking is an opportunity, but it's also a challenge because the challenge is how do we get that right? And we've been holding workshops recently over the summer with academic and software developers just to get uh, their thoughts on how might we do this and what's come back is it's great we want to do this we want to support you but actually it's really difficult so it's going to be a process we're not going to have it solved in one go it's going to take time um, but that's why we have R&D programs like the uh, improvements program that I've talked about um, if you want more we've got a website um, email me at fhip at environment agency uh, .gov .uk. Uh, do a search for Flood Hydrology Improvements Programme on the web if you wish. I think it's probably enough for me.